Good day. Um, hello, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. My name is Ann Aiken. I'm the Acting Federal Officer for the National Vaccine Advisory Committee. There are a few things that you should know before we get started today. Um, this is a public meeting. It's being recorded. Um, all statements made today are on the record. Second, this advisory council is governed by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, or FACA for short. FACA provides rules about the circumstances by which agencies or officers of the federal government can establish or control committees or groups like this one to obtain advice or recommendations. The voting members are um, special government employees who follow um, who are subject to conflict of interest laws and regulations, as are all members who work for the federal government. These members previously provided information about their personal, professional, and financial interests. Each voting member's financial interests and outside affiliation has been carefully screened um, each year to ensure that they comply with federal ethics law. The liaison and representatives are non-voting members of the advisory council and are not subject to the same FACA rules as the voting members. Additionally, the information provided in this meeting does not necessarily represent the official position of the National Vaccine Advisory Committee or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Mentions of products, processes, services, manufacturers, companies, or trademarks does not constitute its endorsement or recommendation by the U.S. government, the Department of Health and, Service, Health and Human Services, or the National Vaccine Advisory Committee. So uh, let's proceed with roll call for today's meeting. I'm going to take the official attendance and call each call off each of the names of the NVAC members. Please verbally respond when I do so. Dr. Bob Hopkins. Present. Happy to be here. Hello. Melody Butler. Good afternoon, and I'm happy to be here. Hi. Jeff Dushan. Good morning. Good morning. Daniel Hoft. I'm here. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Molly Howell. I'm here. Good, mor good morning. Jewel Mullen. Stephen Rindernecht. Uh, good morning or afternoon. Depending on where you are. Yes, good morning. Robert Schechter. Hello, thank you. Thank you. Wynano Stolzfus. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning. Gita Swami. Here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Robert Swanson. Good morning. Good morning. Roxana Dibba. Good morning. Good morning. I, I always forget to, I should call you in the other section, but you're on both here. Um, Chris Regal. Claire Hannon. Hello, everyone. I'm here. Good morning. Good afternoon. Rebecca Coyle. Courtney Lando is here for Rebecca Coyle. Good morning. Hi, Courtney. Uh, Mitch Rothholz, are you here? Yes, I'm here present. Hello. Meredith Allen. Matt Bobo. Kelsey Young. Justin Mills. Yes, I'm here, present. Hello, Justin. Kim Armstrong. Yes, I'm here, thanks. Hello. Uh, Mo Patel. Present, thank you. Thank you. Mary Beth Hans, I think it's gonna be a, a little bit late. John Iskander. I'm here, thank you. Hello. Um, Roxana, Roxana, I will not call you again because we know you're here. Um, Uzo Chukwuma. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. Good morning. Uh, Andrew Ford. Here. Hello. And Troy Knight. Hi, Ann. I'm here. Thanks. Hello. Um, so before I introduce Admiral Levine, I wanted to recognize the committee chair, Dr. Bob Hopkins, for his leadership on NVAC and just being a wonderful person to work with. I'd also like to thank our support team who play pivotal roles in the management of this committee, including Rebecca Lazaration, Viola Jacobs, and Emily Downs. 
Chloe Loving um, is new to the NVAC team, um, but has worked in our office for a little bit on a variety of advisory committees. And so we're really lucky to have her join us. And then Dr. Maureen Goodenow, who's joining me in the room, um, is working with our team on a variety of issues, including vaccinations, um, and brings a wealth of experience and expertise from the NIH and other, other groups. Um, so we're, we're thrilled to have you join us. Um, I also wanted to briefly thank the studio team, um, our tech support, our sign language interpreters. Um, we have three sign language interpreters today to help make the meeting more accessible, as well as a note taker and, um, you know, just wonderful tech support. So thank you for all that you do, because I um, have demonstrated earlier today that I couldn't do it without you. Uh, both Kay um, Hayes and Tim Harrison, our office director and principal deputy director, provide you know, a lot of consistent and thoughtful leadership to the National Vaccine Program. So I wanted to officially thank them for the, their efforts. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, Admiral Rachel Levine. Admiral Levine, as um, many of you know, is the Assistant Secretary for Health at HHS, and she is the Director of the National Vaccine Program. Admiral Levine has a rich clinical and public health background to inform her work at HHS. And she, um, I can attest to the fact that she works hard every day to provide leadership across um, the portfolio that she works on, but also um, specific to what we work on. You know, for example, reducing vaccine hesitancy and misinformation, encouraging vaccination across the lifespan, promoting health equity, um, and addressing mis opportunities or barriers in the immunization system. Emma Levine has recorded her welcome remarks for the meeting today. So with that, I'm gonna ask Rebecca, to um, start them for us. Thank you, Anne, for that introduction. It is a pleasure to welcome the NVAC members, all of the speakers over the course of this two-day meeting and those watching online. As the Assistant Secretary for Health, building a stronger foundation for immunizations is a very important priority for me. In my role, I advocate for vaccinations to ensure that people can get the immunizations that they need on time. It is an essential responsibility shared by many, including other public health leaders, healthcare providers, families and communities, and others working to support the delivery of health services. I work hand in hand with many champions for immunizations and public health, including Ms. Kay Hayes, who has a dynamic infectious disease prevention portfolio and takes a proactive approach to addressing public health threats with innovative and effective solutions. Kay and her team in the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy show unwavering dedication to improving the vaccination system in our country. I want to thank Anne and the NVAC team for their work to support immunizations as well. In looking at the robust agenda for this meeting, I am heartened by the continued commitment represented in the sessions by the immunization community on the agenda. While there is great work being done across the field, it is also clear that we still have work to do to make meaningful change. Unfortunately, measles, one of the most contagious diseases, has made me very concerned. I appreciate NVAC's proactive approach over the years in hosting sessions about localized outbreaks and preventative measures we can take to prevent measles. While measles had been eradicated in the United States more than 20 years ago, we have seen recent cases in several states. In 2023 alone, a total of 58 measles cases were reported in 20 jurisdictions around the country. And this year, CDC has confirmed more cases. Most of these cases were among children and adolescents who were not fully vaccinated to protect them from getting measles if exposed. As you well know, measles outbreaks can happen anywhere people are unvaccinated or undervaccinated. While most children in the United States are up to date with their measles vaccinations, too many of our children still need protection. Recent data from the CDC show that 91% of children under age two years have received the recommended two doses of the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. This is lower than the Healthy People 2030 goal of 95%. Additionally, some communities have even lower vaccination coverage that puts them at greater risk for outbreaks. 
I look forward to hearing more about the presentations from the speakers today as the committee discusses both the global surge in measles cases and recent outbreaks in Idaho and Pennsylvania. I also want to encourage the healthcare providers participating in the meeting today to be on the alert for patients with febrile rash and measles symptoms such as cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis, and those who recently traveled abroad, especially to areas with ongoing measles outbreaks. To be effective in our disease prevention goals, we must also fully use them to get more people vaccinated. For example, requiring vaccination for kids in school, a topic on your agenda, is key to reducing preventable illnesses. Other evidence-based approaches that promote uptake of vaccinations include patient reminders and recalls, standing orders, and incentives to patients and families to overcome hesitancy. A healthcare provider's strong and clear recommendation, as described in NVAC standards for immunization practice, are central to promoting vaccine uptake and reducing vaccine hesitancy. Proven science-based methods help inform our programs and policies and allow us to focus on what's effective, scalable, and sustainable. For example, the Vaccines for Children program has been helping families protect their children for over 30 years. I want to congratulate the dedicated people who work on or with this program, which covers the cost of vaccines for eligible children whose family may not be able to afford them. The program has brought and continues to bring crucial life-saving vaccines and prioritizes underserved communities to help address vaccine equity. This program, in fact, came into being after major measles outbreaks and helped to bring in sharp declines in measles cases that we used to see when I began practicing medicine in the 1980s. I am glad NVAC is celebrating these efforts with a panel later today. This program has been a game changer in childhood vaccination and deserves recognition and praise from public health leaders. While evidence is a cornerstone in our work, it's also important to foster innovation so we can continue to improve efforts and the science base. I appreciate your dedication and commitment in support of NVAC's work to advance innovation across the immunization system. And I want to thank the NVAC committee chairs Dr. Jewel Mullen and Bob Swanson, as well as all of the committee members for their work on the innovation in immunization charge. The innovation work, which is well represented in your agenda, will help to inform HHS and others in developing better solutions in the future. I urge you to keep up your great work. Thank you very much for your time today. I want you to know that your expertise is invaluable to me and to HHS as we strive for healthy people, healthy communities, and a healthy nation for all. I will now turn to Dr. Hopkins to provide the chair's welcome. Well, good morning. Welcome. And I appreciate the members and others who are online joining us for today's NBAC meeting. I want to thank Dr. Levine for your thoughtful remarks, and thank you, Anne, for getting us started and to the NVAC team for its work in planning the meeting and supporting the committee throughout the year. I also want to express my thanks to the NVAC members and subcommittee members for their dedication to further the work of this committee. I look forward to the presentations and discussions today and tomorrow. Let's begin with a few housekeeping items, and then we can move on to the review and approval of the minutes from the September 21-22-2023 meeting, followed by a high-level overview of the agenda. In terms of housekeeping, I want to make sure everyone is aware that this is a public meeting. It's being webcasted on the HHS website. I also want to let everyone know that we have sign language interpreters available on the HHS live stream, and I appreciate their work to make our broadcast more inclusive. We ask that everyone speak slowly and clearly to assist them in supporting our meeting. For our virtual participants, please remember to mute yourself when not speaking, and please do not use your camera unless you're presenting, asking questions, or answering a question. During discussion, I ask that all members and speakers identify themselves before speaking if I didn't acknowledge you by name and giving you the floor. This helps the note taker and others to follow along. Throughout the day, there will be opportunities for committee discussion. 
If you'd like to ask a question or provide a comment, please send me a message through the chat feature. NVAC members previously received the minutes from the September 21 to 22 meeting. Do any of the members want to make corrections to those uh, minutes? I do not see uh, any notes in the chat. Uh, Anne, do you have any uh, requests? I do not. Right. Uh, could I have a motion to approve our minutes from the February or the September meeting? This is Melody Butler, and I make a motion to approve the meeting minutes. Thank you, Melody. Could I have a second, please? This is Gita Swami, second. Thank you, Gita. We appreciate the, the motion and the second to approve our minutes. Um, do we have any uh, no votes to approve the minutes? I see none and hear none. We will consider our minutes from the September meeting approved. Thank you all for your review uh, and for the motion and second. For some more uh, uh, information for the meeting, as always, members of the public can provide public comment by phone at about 5 p.m. Eastern time, both today and tomorrow. Public comments are not a question and answer session. They represent an opportunity for individuals who'd like to make a statement to do so. The deadline to request a space for verbal public comments during the meeting has passed. However, anyone can submit a written comment up to three pages in length to NVAC at HHS.gov. This concludes uh, our housekeeping session and remarks. I'd now like to spend a few minutes reviewing the agenda for our meeting. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers. Today, we'll start with a panel speaking to the recent increase in measles cases. We'll then hear about innovative insights regarding the pipeline and industry investment for vaccine manufacturing. Following that panel, we'll hear an update from the Innovation and Immunization Subcommittee on their report. We'll then have a brief break. Uh, following that, we will hear from experts about creating and maintaining a strong supply chain for vaccine manufacturing. Then we'll hear from two panels focused on different aspects of childhood immunizations. The first will discuss state policies on immunization for child entry. The second will discuss the Vaccines for Children program. As I mentioned previously, we will close the day with public comment. Tomorrow, we'll open with a panel on artificial intelligence and its use in vaccine development and immunization efforts. Then we'll hear from a panel on innovative approaches to improve adult immunization efforts. After a short break, we'll hear from a panel of experts on vaccinating pregnant people. Then we'll hear from a panel of experts on practices for immunization for special needs individuals. The day will conclude with our federal agency and liaison member updates and public comments. Finally, as a reminder, please hold our remaining 22-24 meeting dates on your calendars, June 13th to 14th and September 12th to 13th. Please refer to the NVAC website for final details on the upcoming meeting. Before we get started with our meeting, I want to take a moment to share some sad news. It's with a heavy heart that I announce the passing of one of NVAC's longstanding colleagues, Dr. Jeff Kelman. He died on February 8th after an illness. Dr. Kelman was the Chief Medical Officer for the Center of Medicare at CMS and served as the CMS representative on NVAC for many years. Jeff started at CMS in 2005 and worked hard every day to make people's lives better. He helped to implement the Part D program, as well as studied the safety and effectiveness of vaccines for COVID-19, pneumococcal disease, pertussis, and flu vaccines. I recently worked with Jeff on the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices COVID-19 Vaccine Safety Technical Work Group. This group worked for over two years reviewing COVID-19 vaccine safety data and provided updates to this committee. He also worked with others to examine ways to use annual Medicare wellness visits to improve immunization rates in Medicare beneficiaries. He won an award for this work at the 2018 National Adult and Influenza Immunization Summit. Jeff helped to support adult vaccination and equity and immunization work on NVAC throughout the years. I appreciate his thoughtfulness and help. Jeff will be missed by many. Mary Beth Hans will say a few words in celebration of his life and work during her CMS update tomorrow. 
In honor of Jeff today, I'd like to have a moment of silence and remembrance. I want to thank you for joining me in that moment in remembrance of Jeff. Now, let's get started with our first panel for the day. This panel is entitled, A 30-Fold Surge in Measles Cases in 2023, Protecting the Unvaccinated. Measles is one of our most contagious infectious diseases. It spreads easily. It's a dangerous pathogen acutely and can also have a devastating post-infectious complications, especially in young children, pregnant people, and the immunocompromised. Historically, one in five people with measles require hospitalization with complications including severe breathing issues, blindness, and brain swelling. There's no specific antiviral treatment for measles infection. Thus, prevention with two doses of a safe and effective vaccine is particularly critical. As Admiral Levine mentioned, to protect communities from measles outbreaks, vaccination rates need to be as high as 95%. The current vaccination in the U.S. is unfortunately below that below the Healthy People 2030 goals. Additionally, there are pockets of communities in the U.S. with far lower coverage rates. According to the Centers for Disease Control and World Health Organization, global measles cases rose 18% last year from the year before. In this session, the speakers will discuss the current situation and thoughts about how to reverse the backslide in vaccine coverage rates. In this panel, we'll hear from Dr. Natasha Krawcroft from the World Health Organization Dr. Jose Hagen from the World Health Organization, Dr. Joshua Sharfstein from the Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Christine Hahn from the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, and Dr. Shara Epstein from the Philadelphia Health Department. Dr. Krawcroft, the floor is yours. You may please begin. Thank you very much uh, and um, greetings to everyone. Can you hear me okay? You are loud and clear. Great, thank you. So um, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I'm uh, Natasha Crowcroft. I'm the Senior Technical Advisor on Measles and Rubella at the World Health Organization in, in Geneva, currently in Cairo, Egypt. Um, so I'm gonna very briefly just start the ball rolling by talking about the importance of measles, um, current trends in global measles epidemiology and vaccine coverage um, and conclusions and um, action gaps. Next slide, please. So um, as we've just heard, measles is an incredibly um, impactful disease and the vaccine is also incredibly impactful being safe and effective. So from the global perspective, um, we can't actually achieve our global goals unless we address measles. Um, currently, the global strategy is called Immunization Agenda 2030. And it, um, it, it's aiming to save 50 million lives in, um, by, by 2030. And, um, and measles vaccine is projected to prevent 37% of those 50 million. So um, really, we can't get anywhere unless we address measles. Measles vaccine is, is very cost effective. 75% of the economic benefits of vaccination in the, in the essential program of vaccination. Um, and it costs for 25% of the costs in the program because many of the newer vaccines are much, much more expensive. So we've got this really amazing um, intervention. Uh, so we, you know, we, we need to, to take advantage of that. Next slide, please. So within the global strategy, we talk about measles as a tracer. It's um, a priority. And we talk about using the measles cases and the outbreaks to identify weaknesses in immunization programs and to guide programmatic planning. And as part of that, um, oh, sorry, I just saw a note about my camera. Okay, can you see me now? Apologies for that. I had obviously had my camera cover on, excuse me. Um, so um, as, um, as part of that strategy, um, we have a target of actually reaching uh, the second dose measles vaccine coverage at about 90% by the year 2030, which I'll um, show you in a, a moment is a very ambitious target. Uh, we, When we think about immunization in countries like the USA, we're talking about routine immunization, but in the lowest income countries, the ones that are 
eligible for funding from the global um, Gavi, the, the vaccine alliance, those countries are really relying on having campaigns to reach their targets. Um, about 90% of Gavi eligible countries have to, um, in order to protect children, rely on campaigns. Uh, middle, many middle income countries also require campaigns and they're currently struggling because they have problems getting access to funding to do that. In the sustainable development goals, um, we ha also see measles vaccine coming up and the second dose coverage is an indicator of the fully vaccinated child in those sustainable development goals. So this is just, I'm very rapidly going through a few of the pieces of global, at global level of pieces of strategy that um, surround measles vaccine being incredibly important. Um, and yet we're, we're really not getting there. And we have this real issue. Um, measles as a tracer makes the inequity in our systems around the world in, in countries very visible to us all. And uh, we definitely need to take more action to address this. Next slide, please. So this is what our, at a global level our data are looking like right now. This is all WHO regions um, by month um, and uh, the latest report we have. And if you look through the top panel in this, what really jumps out is the big peak in 2019. That was a very bad year for measles globally. We have um, that there were the more cases um, in that year than we'd seen since uh, 1996. So we had this very, very big outbreak year. And then following that year, 2019, you see the numbers really fall away. And that reflects the, the impact of the pandemic with shut with lockdowns and uh, reduction in international travel. What's concerning us right now is if you see 2022 cases when started to to go up and then in 2023 they went up further and we're a little bit concerned we're now in the same or similar position to what we see epidemiologically in the the run-up to that 2019 year um where suddenly we had this explosion of cases and um and that's that's what's troubling us right now next slide please What we're also seeing that accompanies this concern about the, the pattern in, in cases is an increase in outbreaks. So the number of large or disruptive outbreaks, which is defined as a country with an incidence more than 20 per million, that has increased from 32 in the whole of 2022 to 51 in 2023. Um, there have been ongoing large or disruptive outbreaks in the African region. So the more recent increase has actually mainly been observed in the Eastern Mediterranean region and um, the European region, and to some extent in, in Southeast Asia, but we'll hear more about Euro shortly. Next, um, next slide, please. With the reason for this, why is it happening? Well, we really haven't seen the recovery in measles vaccine coverage globally, as we've seen for um, for other antigens. So DTP coverage uh, rose to within 1% of its pre-pandemic levels, but um, measles containing vaccine, the first dose coverage remained 3% below the pre-pandemic peak. And we already know that that is, was not high enough because we need 95% coverage in the routine program uh, to avoid outbreaks. So we're still a, a way off that globally. And if you go to the next slide, uh, please, what we see in low income countries is actually backsliding. So, so rather than not recovering as well, we actually see a fall backwards. So we've, we've lost 7% in our coverage in low income countries. Um, we're already, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're already way behind in low income countries, but they've, they've fallen uh, even further. I'm sorry, it's actually 7%, but there's a typo on this slide. It should say falling another 7% rather than 1%. Um, next slide, please. The, the other thing, and these are CDC data um, that we're very worried about, is what's going to happen in 2024, given big gaps in immunity. And so um, when we look at, at the levels of unimmunized children and, and calculate the gaps, taking into account routine immunization coverage and campaign coverage, what we're seeing is that more than half of the countries in the world will be at high risk of measles outbreaks by the end of 2024. Um, and about half of those are lower middle income countries. It adds up to 142 million children under five being susceptible to measles 
um, and most of those live in lower and middle, middle income countries um, and 62% in settings where we identify those countries to be at highest or high risk of an outbreak by the end of this year. So we're, we're really looking at this year with a great deal of concern and hoping that we're going to be wrong because this is a prediction. We don't know what's going to really happen. Um, we're hoping that that action will be taken to catch up and fill these immunity gaps um, urgently to prevent outbreaks occurring. Next slide, please. The inequity really um, is, this is, these are data from 2022 because we don't have 2023 data available yet. But when you look at deaths, the inequity really jumps out. Um, these are our estimates that were published in the MMWR in November 2023. And you see um, in highlighted in yellow, the percentage of deaths in the African and Eastern Mediterranean regions. And those two add up to um, nine, more than 90% of the deaths, but they're only 24% of the world's population. So we've got this real focus of, uh, of deaths in, um, in these most uh, vulnerable populations uh, where countries are affected by, uh, children are affected in those countries by malnutrition, by conflict, by migration, forced migration. Um, so there are really uh, multiple deprivations there. Next slide, please. The good news is that we are still vaccinating. We're still moving forward in many countries. Measles vaccination prevented an estimated 57 million deaths worldwide um, up to 2022, including 2022. So, I mean, there is good news to talk about as well. Uh, we have this amazing intervention. And we, if we can only get it to all children in the world, then um, it would be even better. Next slide, please. Rubella elimination, we feel, is a pathway towards measles elimination because we're making really steady progress there. We've got um, half of the, children, of the countries in the world have, have successfully been verified for rubella elimination, and we're making good progress on measles elimination as well. So with this kind of paradox where um, we're, we have countries making really great progress and sustaining that, that progress, uh, at the same time, it's almost like inequity is just growing as the countries that are left behind are being left further and further behind. Next slide, please. So um, to wrap up, I, I want to set measles as a crisis among many crises, and they're very much interrelated. Uh, we've got climate change causing droughts and nutritional um, issues in children, which is increasing the risk of death from measles. Um, we have conflict that's disrupting immunization programs. We're coming out of pandemic that has disrupted immunization programs around the world, really. Um, and um, environmental issues like flooding obviously disrupt healthcare delivery as well. So um, in multiple crises that are all having an impact. And yet, despite this, even in settings of severe conflict, we we do manage to meet, meet children where, where there's a will, there's a way. And we manage to, to reach children and uh, protect them in many, many very challenging settings. So I, you know, I'm full of admiration for all of the staff who managed to reach kids and get them, get them vaccinated in those circumstances. So there is hope we, we can do it and we have a tool that will save lives and we need to get it to children everywhere in every country. So I, that's my last slide at this point. I'd like to um, hand back to the chair and, and to my next speaker, and to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crowcroft. Uh, we will now turn the floor to Dr. Jose Hagen. Dr. Hagen, your slides are up. You have the floor. Great. Good evening. Um, so uh, my name is Jose Hagen. I'm at the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe in the Vaccine and Pre Vaccine Preventable Disease and Immunization Unit. I'm the team leader for disease control and elimination, which uh, covers the vaccine prone prevent, uh, vaccine preventable diseases that, so that are prone to outbreaks and those diseases that are targeted for elimination and eradication. Next slide. So I'll start just with some context here about the, the WHO European region, which includes 53 member states in Europe and Central Asia. Um, as you heard from uh, Natasha, um, all the countries in the world have adopted a goal of measles and rubella elimination in uh, Euro, 33 countries of 53 have been verified to have eliminated measles, and 49 of 53 have eliminated endemic rubella. 
We receive surveillance data on measles on a monthly cycle. Um, almost all the countries in our region submit case-based or zero reporting data. Um, we still have two that submit aggregated data. Uh, there's generally a delay of a couple of months from, uh, from case onset and the data do change over time due to case reclassification, reporting delays, et cetera. Um, so what I'm, preventing, what I'm presenting uh, today as far as surveillance data um, are data that were submitted as of February 9th and the immunization data are from the latest WHO UNICEF joint estimate of national immunization coverage for each country, and that includes data up to 2022. Uh, next slide. So um, as you similar slide to what you saw uh, Natasha present, um, the immunization coverage in the European region um, has been stable and rising uh, since 2010 up to 2019, where it peaked at 96% region-wide for the first dose and 92% uh, for a second dose coverage. Um, and as we saw globally during the COVID-19 pandemic, immunization coverage fell um, by a, a modest amount in our region, just a couple of points, but it has not recovered by 2022. And we're awaiting the 2023 numbers to see the impact of our recovery efforts. You can see um, the same resurgence of measles uh, in 2018, 2019 um, that Natasha uh, described. Um, so the, the blue bars are the case counts over time. Um, so we had this large scale resurgence of measles in Europe that coincided with the worldwide resurgence that affected all five regions. Um, these cases disappeared with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we had a couple years of peacetime um, during 2021, 2022, at least with respect to measles. Um, and then in 2023, uh, we had this large increase, which was a, a 62 fold rise in measles cases in, in the region. Next slide. So in this figure, I'm looking at the coverage in more detail. Um, so I'm exploring this region-wide drop in, in, in measles-containing vaccine second dose coverage um, in 2020 compared to 2019. So although we only saw a, a, a one-point drop uh, region-wide from 2019 to 2020 um, in the sort of overall regional second dose coverage, but you can see that this represents a major shift in the number of countries that are able to achieve the coverage target of 95% from 21 countries in 2019 down to only 12 countries in 2020. And even more concerning, we saw an increase in the number of countries that uh, for whom the second dose coverage fell below 90%. Next slide. So I'm looking a little more closely now at the, the difference in the impact of COVID-19 on immunization coverage between the countries um, and the inequities within the region um, that you can see when I compare the high income countries on the left with the middle income countries on the right. So the first thing you might notice is that prior to the pandemic, the high income countries, countries had a, a good deal of variability in their immunization coverage. Um, with most countries not able to achieve the 95% target. So there's, even within the um, high income countries, um, there are some that uh, really struggle to, to, to break 90%. Whereas the middle income countries generally uh, were doing better in terms of their estimated um, national level coverage. Um, but the impact of the pandemic really was disproportionately felt by the middle income countries with a huge decrease in the proportion achieving 95% coverage and a doubling of the countries that fell below 90% coverage. Next slide. And so here I'm, I'm looking even more at the inequities um, uh, within countries. So in addition to these differences um, at the national level between countries, um, there are a lot of inequities at the subnational level. And so these, these figures are looking at the proportion of districts within countries that are achieving the various immunization coverage levels. And so you can see that even within the high income, high income countries on the left, there are districts that have extremely low measles vaccine coverage, even below 50% in some countries. And on the right, you can see again, that we have a much more pronounced impact of the COVID pandemic um, on the middle income countries and on increasing this inequity um, within the countries. Next slide. 
So looking at the, the, the accumulation of the impact of um, this fall and immunization coverage and the sort of chronic um, low coverage that some countries experience. Um, so I'm looking here at the impact of the coverage on the accumulation of susceptible children by calculating the total number of children in each birth cohort who are not protected through routine immunization or through large scale supplemental immunization campaigns. And we're comparing that number of accumulated susceptible children to the size of each country's birth cohort. There's a general uh, pattern or principle that we've learned about measles epidemiology over the years that when the number of unvaccinated children reaches the size of a birth cohort, that country um, is at higher risk of a large outbreak. So you can see that most countries in Europe, um, at least according to this calculation, are at or near this threshold of one birth cohort's worth of children under five who are susceptible to measles. Um, so this model is based only on the reported first and second dose coverage that makes it into the, the, the joint estimates um, of national immunization coverage. It, it doesn't account for vaccination that is uh, caught up uh, behind schedule. It doesn't account for any supplemental immunization like intensified routine, catch-ups, et cetera. So this is to some degree worst case scenario. And in most countries, some of the gap has been filled in some way or another. Um, but we also know that in some of the countries, uh, we know there are immunization uh, sort of immunity gaps that are not reflected by the national level immunization coverage figures where they have major issues with um, estimating their denominators or calculating accurate coverage of their vaccination. And we see that a lot in the Eastern part of our, of our region and the Central Asian countries. Um, and so in those countries, the risk of outbreak is greatly outsized compared to the risk implied by, by the national coverage figures. But generally, this is a picture that is compatible with what we're seeing epidemiologically. We're seeing a lot of outbreaks and resurgence of transmission because of this accumulation of unvaccinated children, um, especially uh, exacerbated by the fall in coverage during COVID. Next slide. So coming back to the epidemiology, you know, here's the, the effect of that accumulated um, susceptibility of children and um, other age groups. This is an epi curve of the confirmed measles cases in the European region during 2018 to 2023. So once again, we see the large scale resurgence of the region um, leading up to the onset of COVID, this quiescent period as a result of the pandemic and the interventions that were put in place on hygiene and movement and social gathering, and to some extent from disruption of surveillance priorities. But the outbreaks in 2018, 2019 had a lot more cases than the current resurgence. Um, during um, 2019, there was 49 uh, member states that reported over 100,000 cases, 64 deaths. And you can see that uh, Ukraine carried a lot of that weight. During 2023, we had 58,000 cases from 41 member states, including 10 um, officially reported measles attributable deaths. Um, many of the same countries that had large outbreaks in the resurgence of 2018, 2020 um, are starting to experience cases again in 2023. And this is sort of consistent with this um, almost traditional four to five year cycle we see in endemic countries that have weaker immunization programs leading to accumulation of susceptible children. Next slide. So looking now just at 2023, you can see this increase in cases following the typical fall, winter seasonal pattern of peak transmission in several countries. Um, when initial cases were detected, um, most countries began uh, smaller scale outbreak response activities, but beginning around May to June, the affected countries started to conduct larger scale outbreak response activities, including mass vaccinations and intensified routine immunization. Um, we did have uh, some, um, prepar some preparatory work in 2022 when countries were first starting to get, uh, to get their breath back after COVID-19. And so many countries did do some preventive campaigns and catch up immunization to fill the, immun the immunity gap that had grown and that uh, blunted, I think to some extent what we're seeing now, but clearly uh, the gap remains. Next slide. 
So I'm showing the the top five countries that are most affected by measles outbreaks during this during December 2023. So like what the most recent situation is, and you can see that most of those countries are at a plateau or decreasing in their transmission. However, there is one country in particular, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan that has dominated transmission in December and is still at a logarithmic phase of the outbreak. Next. I'm looking again at the same data, but on a log scale, just to show this trend a bit more clearly. Um, most of the countries are to some degree plateauing, um, still though with, with significant numbers of cases in some countries clearly. Um, but really it's only Azerbaijan that are still showing this kind of log transmission indicative of the beginning of an overwhelming outbreak. Next slide. So here I'm, I'm showing the breakdown of case distribution by age group and vaccination status in, in 2018, 2023. Um, so during the current uh, resurgence, we're seeing that there's a predominance of cases under age five. Um, there are some cases among your older children and young adults, um, accounting for age distribution of the population. It's still overwhelmingly the youngest children. Um, this is very different than what we saw during the peak of the 2018, 2019 resurgence. And that was a much wider age range that was affected, including older children and adults. And that really reflected uh, what Natasha referred to, which is this um, uh, residual immunity gaps across multiple birth cohorts um, resulting from sins of the long past and this relative period of, of peacetime in our region with very low levels of endemic transmission where this population immunity gap was not challenged by large scale importation of the, of the virus. What we're currently experiencing uh, really is the result of accumulation of susceptible children who are not reached by immunization programs that were impacted by the COVID pandemic. Next slide. So I'll just end here with a couple of discussion points. You know, just to summarize a bit, we are experiencing um, a number of outbreaks in the European region. Most predominantly, this is in the eastern part of the region in Central Asia, but it's affecting um, most of the countries to some degree or another. You know, these outbreaks began in 2023, and for the most part, we see a plateau in Europe, except for um, an overwhelming outbreak in Azerbaijan. There have been ongoing outbreak response activities, and I think hopefully we'll, we'll see the impact of those in the next couple of months. But you know, these outbreaks are really revealing vulnerabilities, um, particularly these middle-income countries, and the need for us to really better understand the subnational inequities and you know, overcoming the uncertainties and denominators that make uh, national immunization coverage figures not uh, reliable. Um, as many of the affected countries really report actually very high coverage at the national level. So we're working with countries to understand and fill those immunity gaps and strengthen surveillance and outbreak preparedness and address some of the systematic uh, issues that are underlying the inequities in vaccination strategies and service delivery. Next slide, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Hagen. Uh, our next presenter is Josh, Dr. Joshua Sharfstein from Johns Hopkins University. Sharfstein, your slides are up, you have the floor. Great, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate the chance to be here and um, have to say the last two presentations are quite sobering about the state of measles around the world. I'm not going to be giving a comprehensive assessment in the US, but I will um, provide an overview as well as some initial thoughts about the importance of um, a comprehensive response. So why don't we go to the next slide? Um, there is measles in the United States again. Um, I think we had about 1,900 cases in 2019. We have 20 so far in 2024 um, on the other side of the pandemic, but um, a big concern for uh, the potential for outbreaks. Um, there are cases in multiple states and a whole bunch of news headlines already this year. Um, next slide. So um, there have been some interesting studies because, as we know, it's all about the vaccination rate when it comes to measles outbreaks. And uh, during the pandemic, vaccination dropped in the United States. And in uh, this one study in vaccine, it suggested that we could wind up with um, uh, a significant uh, drop 
um, because of the pandemic, that if it persisted, would really expose the U.S. to the kind of vulnerability that we just heard about for Europe. Um, next slide. They also modeled um, that maybe it bounces back from the pandemic, but then there's an impact from increased vaccine hesitancy. And that is a different kind of fallout from the pandemic, the pandemic fallout not being just not getting vaccinated, but the pandemic fallout being more vaccine hesitancy because of all of the um, challenges around the COVID vaccine um, kind of affecting the conversation on childhood vaccines. And so that also poses a risk. So we have really two risks in the US, one that people won't get caught up in time um, with vaccinations just because of the challenges during the pandemic. But the other maybe more serious challenge is that we're in a bit of a hangover from all of the um, activity around vaccines during the pandemic and that that could um, have an impact on, on measles. Next slide. So um, this is a, a recent survey from Pew Charitable Trust, which had a nice headline that Americans largely have positive views of childhood vaccinations and that they're generally holding steady. Um, but if you go to the second paragraph, and if you click once, it says here that uh, the survey finds that alongside broad support for childhood vaccines, there are signs of some concern that uh, parents see the risk of MMR vaccines is a bit higher um, than other Americans. About half of those with a young child see the statement, I worry that not all childhood vaccines are necessary, describes their views at least somewhat well, with mothers having um, more concerns about MMR side effects than fathers. So, um, you know, those are certainly uh, areas of some concern or into Pew Charitable Trust. And I think we know a bit why um, we should be worried about this. Next slide. And that is because we're not in a battle with the measles virus. We're in a battle with um, the measles virus alongside a whole lot of misinformation that is good news for the measles virus spread. And that uh, misinformation comes from uh, people who are opposed to vaccines. Um, they may have all kinds of other ideas for things that people should do to protect themselves, but um, they don't like the measles vaccine. Um, and there is a lot of misinformation online and it's surging into the gap um, uh, post pandemic as parents are you know, getting back to the routines of childhood immunization. These are just a couple of very recent headlines and you know, the, there's all kinds of myths, including that measles is a mild disease and it's good to have, and, you know, um, all kinds of other um, untruths about the vaccine itself. So spreading not just on, you know, more common social media platforms, but in all kinds of closed uh, chat groups and, and other things like that. Next slide. So um, I think the implications in the US, um, we have a fantastic uh, program, the Vaccines for Children program that makes the measles and MMR vaccines widely available. Um, most people can get vaccines uh, for, for their kids, uh, almost everybody uh, pretty easily um, or reasonably easily. It's not a supply issue. It is a competence issue and it's a hesitancy issue in the US. And that's really the, the main um, uh, area of uh, battle right now um, against measles. And so it requires more than just vaccine-focused campaigns. Um, it's really important for public health at every level and beyond public health, civil society that cares about not having massive outbreaks of vaccine-preventable disease to remind people the value of vaccines generally, and particularly the measles vaccine for protecting against outbreaks. Um, I once wrote something about the outbreak that happened at Disneyland. Um, this is when there were uh, blogs that had headlines like Space Mountain with a side of measles and Mickey Mouse gets the measles. And I found uh, as a pediatrician at the time that this um, really gave an opening to talking about this with parents you know, and others even in the policy world proactively, that one of the reasons we vaccinate against measles is so we don't have outbreaks at Disneyland. I used to actually have a, um, a Mickey Mouse on my, my stethoscope so I could use that to spark the conversation because a lot of people remember that there was an outbreak. And if there's an outbreak at Disneyland, then 
a lot of kids with chronic illnesses have to be particularly scared to go to Disneyland. And in fact, at the time, they were really advising certain kids not to go. And is that really the kind of society that we want to live in? There's such incredible benefits to all of us to be uh, have high levels of, of measles vaccine coverage. Next slide. So concretely, um, the work of vaccine programs has got to be more than just delivering vaccines to the clinics. You know, you really have to think about broad coalitions, um, including uh, people across the political spectrum, the business community, um, sports, people who understand the importance of uh, vaccination should all be welcome. Um, networks of trusted messengers are extremely important. Um, CDC is um, very focused on figuring out how to better partner with community organizations and its communications. This is going to be a challenge at every level of public health so that it's not just one public health person who can be the focus of in misinformation as they're trying to get out information, but really it's it's replicated in faith institutions and businesses um, and across society. Clinicians, that it's really important to for clinicians to be prepared to handle questions, and there are all kinds of different trainings and tools that can help them do that and, and help them respond in a productive way to questions that people might bring in because they've seen it online. Um, at a more public health level, there is uh, something that some people call information immunization, where you're talking um, broadly about how um, the, the misinformation is coming and you're trying to um, uh, kind of immunize the population so that they're you know, not shocked when they come across uh, a strange allegation about a vaccine and they, their first instinct is to check it out rather than to believe it. And then there's a whole kind of emerging science of responding to falsehoods that are circulating and people who are running vaccine programs really um, need to get, get into this um, and be prepared if you're in a community and suddenly there's, you know, a rampant rumor that the particular batch of vaccine is actually put injecting tracers into children or some other far-fetched falsehood that there's, you know, it's not just stunned disbelief, which is usually, you know, my reaction to some of these things, but actually um, you're ready with a plan to respond in an effective way. And uh, just recently, uh, funded by CDC, the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security put out a, um, a playbook for a public health to respond. Um, you know, there is evidence that this, this can work. You know, the Made to Save effort partnered with a lot of community organizations and really increased vaccine coverage for COVID in the communities that were highlighted. Um, there's evidence about how um, different kinds of messages ahead of time can be helpful to people's resistance to misinformation. Um, I was part of the Lancet Commission, which had a whole bunch of other recommendations. And this really does um, add up as well to different policy discussions that can be very important at the state and local level and very impactful on vaccination rates. So like it or not, this is the world we live in and the response in the US to um, the measles outbreaks has to be as much about the syringes and the um, actual vials of vaccine as it is about um, recognizing that the, the battle here is not just against the virus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sharfstein. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Christine Hahn from the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare. Dr. Hahn, your slides are up. You have the floor. Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? You are loud and clear. Great, and hopefully I turn my camera on. I don't see it yet, but hopefully you can see me as well. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and just talk about a specific outbreak. And I think what uh, we saw and what um, um, you'll gather as well is that uh, this reflects a lot of what you've already been hearing about uh, why we're concerned about a measles resurgence in the United States. Um, and next slide, please. So I just wanted to, we've, we've heard a lot about how in 2019 things were uh, so bad, and I just wanted to point out, uh, it's hard to make out the outlines of Idaho in that, so I've circled it for you, but those Idaho, Idaho in various estimates uh, was not considered particularly high risk because we don't have a large international pop. This particular study that many of you might be aware of, published in Lancet, um, focused on um, counties that had like large international populations, large international airports, 
um, lower immunization rates, um, things like that, and then also exemption rates, which you'll you'll see uh, Idaho does stand out in. But overall, uh, we weren't predicted to be at particularly high risk uh, compared to some other parts of the country. Um, however, of course, we have all those things. We do have folks that travel internationally. We do have um, uh, struggles in some areas with immunization and so forth. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, where Idaho really stands out, as it were, is we have the highest uh, exemption, kindergarten exemption rate uh, in the nation. Um, this, the way CDC displays it kindly lumps us in with a, a group, but uh, if you look at that uh, dark colored bar, uh, the legend there, we are the 12.1 there. And I think our uh, next closest competitor, I believe is Oregon at about 8% uh, exemption rate. So, and we've traditionally always had higher exemption rates, but in uh, recent years it has particularly increased. Um, and I think as to some of the reasons alluded to earlier, um, during the COVID uh, pandemic, there was a growing sentiment of uh, concern about uh, requirements, um, vaccine mandates, et cetera. So I think we've seen a, a quite an increase. And in particular, looking at our data, uh, we see a particular increase in, uh, we have some public schools that are also online. So these are kids who are either homeschooled entirely or um, um, in part, but they're, they're enrolled at this online public school and they have the highest rate by far in our state of about 60 some percent of those uh, kids have non-medical exemptions. Uh, next slide, please. However, if you look at our, uh, according to the National Immunization Survey, uh, we are, uh, again, we have a smaller number, so you'll see our rates can fluctuate a little bit year to year, but essentially um, our, uh, depending on the year, uh, a little bit higher or lower than the national average, but not statistically different. And this is for the first dose of MMR uh, by age 24 months. Next slide. And in addition, amongst our uh, in teen uh, national immunization survey, we actually have made gains um, throughout the years, um, slow, um, uh, slowly but surely, um, not only amongst our teen vaccination rates, but among uh, those that have had uh, documented two doses of MMR. And much of this, I'm sorry, Rebecca Coyle is not on today, but uh, Rebecca Coyle, some of you might be aware, used to be our immunization program manager here in Idaho and um, is now, of course, working hard to make a improvements to registries. And uh, um, I think that's a large uh, reason why we have seen not only uh, documented improvements in our rates, but uh, actual improvements in our rates as we have a, a, a really robust um, immunization program and efforts going on uh, in the state. Uh, next slide. So to, in particular to our outbreak, uh, just a couple of quick slides here. Uh, we had a, uh, a young adult male who traveled um, internationally. I will say we did not release the country because uh, it is a rural community. We thought it could be identifying, uh, but it was in the European region. Um, and one, one of the countries alluded to in the, one of the, by one of the previous speakers um, and returned to uh, back to Idaho on September 13th. Uh, he was hospitalized, um, uh, but uh, only for a few days, um, recovered and was sent home. Um, and uh, we were notified a few days after he was hospitalized that they did call an infectious disease consult and they astutely suspected measles, um, put him in isolation um, and notified us. And our lab was able to confirm um, that it was a positive uh, PCR. Uh, next slide. So as you can imagine, we launched into a lot of, I won't review these in detail, but we had health alerts, um, media announcements, uh, blogs, et cetera, uh, tried to get the word out, reminding people, uh, as you can see, immunization pro featured prominently in a lot of our announcements. Uh, next slide. And then the public health investigation, of course, the airline investigation, he was infectious uh, on the trip. Uh, CDC, of course, uh, coordinated this with us uh, contributing uh, and other states investigating as well. We do these quite routinely, um, and uh, this was uh, an effort uh, that we participated in. Healthcare workers, of course, at the various institutions were all uh, contacted uh, investigated to see if any of them uh, were susceptible. Uh, and just mostly a couple uh, other visitors to the emergency department and so forth were found to be susceptible and were followed uh, for 21 days. Household, 
uh, a, a, uh, somebody had picked them up from the airport um, that didn't live in the household, but was from the same group of, and uh, had, but was a healthcare worker and was immune. Uh, and then there were uh, nine susceptible family members at home, um, two immune household members, and then a visitor to the home that had reported his. I'm not seeing that the slides are moving forward. We lost your audio for a moment there, Chris. Yeah. Oh, like good gracious. Back. Okay, yeah. so sorry. Um, I Let me just stop my video in case that's causing a problem there. Um, okay, so uh, basically to wrap up, so our, the airline investigation, there were no cases detected linked to this um, healthcare setting, no care cases detected. Again, as you saw, most of the content all developed measles. Um, so for a 100% attack rate amongst the non-immune uh, household members, uh, all have now fully recovered and then none of these um, people required hospitalization. So we ultimately just had the one hospitalized person. Okay, last slide. Oh, sorry, I just wanted to point out this kind of uh, mirrors what we've been talking about. Again, small state, we did have a couple cases back in 2019, which was a first for us. Uh, these are both directly related to travel they had both traveled um, to, again to the European region. Um, and that was a, a, quite a shock for us. We hadn't had cases for so many years, but now of course in 2023, this outbreak uh, puts us at uh, you know, uh, a new high, uh, really since 1991 had been our last large measles outbreak. Next slide, I believe this is my last slide for real. So just in conclusion to kind of where we're at now, uh, we are of course concerned about that. Uh, we have parts of our state. I didn't show this to you. We actually are just looking at our uh, data regionally now, and I don't have that to show you, but we know there are pockets of the state with lower immunization rates. Uh, we do know that the public concern is pretty low. We were surprised. We thought we'd get a ton of media attention around our measles outbreak, and it was really uh, they certainly reported on it, but it, there really wasn't, uh, we, we actually watched our MMR to see if we'd see a bump uh, after all our press releases and blogs, and we did not see a bump in MMR um, after that, very disappointing. We have a high exemption rate, and we are concerned that, as you all know, exempted kids do not necessarily mean unimmunized kids. But we think some of these are parents that just don't want to report anything about their children's health care, health or health care to a school. Uh, but we are concerned that that same uh, reflection of parents that don't necessarily want the government in their business is going to maybe make it challenging for us uh, moving forward to try to improve uh, vaccination rates and maybe hopefully reduce exemption rates in those communities. Uh, we think that uh, this, this hasn't been explicitly commented upon yet, but I think people traveling to uh, let's say Africa or uh, Southeast Asia may go to travel clinics and make sure they're up to date on their immunizations, but travelers going to uh, the European region uh, from the United States don't necessarily uh, think that way and um, may not be getting their MMRs before European travel. Um, and we are also, right now our legislature is in session. I just wanna mention as closing remark that uh, we have several bills going through. I, we've heard comments about kind of post COVID, um, you know, changes in attitudes, and we are certainly seeing a lot of bills going. We don't know if they'll go through yet, uh, but we see some that would turn our immunization registry back from an opt out to an opt in registry uh, that had been changed back in 2010. And we are uh, concerned that's going to go through our vaccine assessment board that right now makes our vaccines be universal purchase uh, uh, is up for renewal this year. We also have several bills that would potentially prohibit us from supporting or recommending any vaccine which is under emergency use authorization, again, after a response to COVID. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Hahn. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Shira Epstein from the Philadelphia Health Department. Dr. Epstein, your slides are up. You have the floor. Thank you for having me. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, I'll also talk uh, 
a bit about our um, recent cluster in Philadelphia. Um, so uh, here's our epi curve, and you can see there our initial case um, actually wasn't a Philadelphia case. Um, it was a, an infant from a surrounding county um, who um, was an international travel, uh, had, had, had an international travel and returned um, and was admitted to uh, one of the local children's hospitals with fever. Um, unfortunately, um, was not on airborne isolation. Um, and after a few days was noted to have a rash, was quickly tested and found to have measles. Um, the children's hospital did a wonderful job um, offering post-exposure prophylaxis, of course, to all of the um, exposed um, children and families. Um, however, unfortunately, a child in a neighboring room and their adult family member were unvaccinated and refused um, post-exposure prophylaxis. Both of them would have been eligible for vaccine. Um, and um, in the week, um, you know, in late December, um, uh, we had been, uh, we, our, our staff had been in constant contact with um, this family um, and uh, um, discussing multiple healthcare visits. This family uh, sought healthcare um, at most healthcare institutions in Philadelphia um, the week of uh, December, you know, 18th, 19th, 20th. Um, and eventually on December 20th, um, in conversations with the Pennsylvania Department of Health, um, uh, we decided to test the, uh, I'm sorry, that December 21st, um, we decided to test the um, ill um, family members um, who had been exposed despite not having a rash. Um, we were leading up to the you know, Christmas weekend and um, knew we would have more limited access once, once that hit. Um, so we sent out a public health nurse on December 21st to test um, that, that, uh, those two contacts, and both of those resulted positive on the 22nd. They actually developed their rash the following day on the 23rd. Um, we had one other healthcare-associated contact test positive later in December, that is a, an infant who had received uh, immunoglobulin for post-exposure prophylaxis and had a very, very mild course and um, without really any complication and did well. Um, unfortunately, when we found out about the um, initial case, the, the, the first two secondary cases that tested positive on the 21st and had their rash on the 23rd, um, they revealed some healthcare exposures um, that had not been previously disclosed, uh, again, despite near constant contact. Um, and um, we, we kind of began our public um, notifications at that point. It wasn't until the early, early January that, um, on January uh, 3rd, I believe, that we were notified by one of those um, initial cases that um, contacts that their, the child's daycare um, were sick and kind of, kind of simultaneously got notification from um, another local children's hospital that they suspected measles in some cases. And at that point, um, we found out that the, um, you know, the cases identified on the 21st actually had been in daycare um, from the 18th to the 21st, including that day our public health nurse uh, tested the, the um, child. Um, so our cases uh, you see there on December 30th and um, December 2nd were all um, daycare contacts, and I'll talk more about those in the next slide. And then um, our, our January 11th case was also associated with that um, daycare. Since then, we haven't had any cases and um, we're just about 42 days uh, in the next couple of days, so we're hopeful. Next slide. So um, just to speak a bit about our, our case characteristics, and this is just the eight Philadelphia cases, um, none of the um, and this doesn't include the initial uh, county case. 
Um, two of our cases were less than um, 12 months old. Four of our cases were in that kind of preschool age range. Um, and then two adult, we had two adult cases. Uh, the two that were less than 12 months old were, of course, unvaccinated. There were five, we had five cases that were um, unvaccinated and all had exemptions. And then one adult case who did report an MMR history and uh, did test IgG positive um, when they presented uh, to care. Um, in the child care, uh, there were about 35 children in the child care. All but one unvaccinated child contracted measles. So, and that unvaccinated child had not been present in the daycare the days that the case um, was there. So every, you know, 100% of unvaccinated children developed measles at that daycare and no vaccinated child or staff member contracted measles. Um, there were six hospitalizations, so very different than um, Idaho's uh, experience. Um, some of those hospitalizations were quite prolonged, but all were eventually discharged home. Next slide. Um, so we, of course, took many actions um, when, when this all started. Um, I think we had many lessons learned and a lot of um, successes from our previous partnerships. Um, we had great partnerships with our early ch childhood education centers um, and leadership from um, our COVID connections. So we um, attended, our staff attended multiple meetings with early childhood education directors in both English and Spanish, um, which were really well received. Um, they were very interested in, um, you know, recognizing measles, uh, uh, methods of, of keeping their, you know, children and staff up to date with their measles vaccine. We have a town hall scheduled with the school district of Philadelphia had to be delayed. So hopefully it will be long after our, our, uh, our outbreak is over, but it will still be valuable. Um, we, um, worked on reactivating some grocery delivery services. This didn't end up um, getting implemented, but um, we hope to have this for any you know, future um, outbreaks um, to, to be able to help people with access to food if they are in isolation or quarantine. Um, we refined um, and created many new communication materials. Um, one of our lessons learned was that the language is most commonly spoken in Philadelphia and in the region where we are seeing these cases had changed um, in recent years. So we um, worked on our rapid translation protocol to make sure we had uh, appropriate uh, communications for, for people in, in that neighborhood. We, our preparedness team actually canvassed um, homes and early, ch early childhood education centers in the neighborhood. That was really well received. Again, um, they had great response rates, really great conversations. And then our um, nurses uh, and other um, clinical staff from the health department went out and did um, testing, both PCR and some serology testing for um, measles. Um, again, both to test for measles and to test for immunity. I'll mention on another slide, but um, many of our adult contacts didn't have evidence of their um, immunity. Next slide. So here are a few of our, um, our uh, materials that we created. We created some specifically for early childhood education centers. Of course, once this hit the news, um, daycare schools were incredibly interested and concerned um, that they could uh, experience outbreaks in their in their schools. Um, we um, you can see there on the right we had a, we created a palm card um, that was passed out by our preparedness team uh, regarding uh, getting vaccinated both at a, a, a clinic that we are uh, scheduled and at um, some of our uh, ambulatory health services clinics, which again I'll mention in the coming slide. Next slide. And again, just some more information. This was more directed at family members. And you can see again there, 
um, information about vaccination and where people can get vaccinated without um, insurance. Next slide. So a bit more of what we did. Um, we, our immunization team sent recall messaging out to families of all residents aged 12 months to six years without a, an MMR vaccination in our immunization information system uh, that was sent out by email and text message. Um, we worked with our ambulatory health centers to uh, offer increased um, access to vaccine. They are always vaccinating, of course, but we um, were able, they were able to implement walk-in hours at several of the centers um, during weekdays and additionally on Saturday. Um, we were able to harness some of our connections from um, vaccinating uh, Ukrainian refugees um, to create a walk-in clinic operated by the Division of Disease Control on very, very short notice. We had um, pre-existing partnerships with a um, with Catholic Social Services in a really ideal location. We had pre-existing relationships, um, a pre-existing nursing contract that we could tap into and really um, create this walk-in vaccine clinic um, within a week. Uh, this clinic saw traffic. Um, uh, all of the all of the people who who uh, came to this clinic found out about it through our canvassing, um, as opposed to any of the text messages or emails. So I think that personal touch was um, hugely important there. Um, and then we contact traced over 150 contacts who didn't have evidence of um, of immunity. Next slide. And then. Um, in addition to that, we started weekly situation update meetings with our surrounding local and state health departments, as well as healthcare facilities. Um, I led those. They were very well attended by more than 100 participants on each, on each meeting. Um, hospitals, healthcare systems were really eager to share information, get information, um, learn from each other. Uh, we developed really great um, relationships with the infection control leadership at those in, uh, at, at various institutions in the city, um, as well, again, as, as the uh, surrounding counties who um, saw a lot of the healthcare visits from some of our, our cases. Um, we had a webinar with primary care providers. We recognized that they had unique challenges. They don't have airborne isolation rooms. They don't always have the same um, infection prevention uh, backup that some of our large institutions do. So um, that was really another valuable outreach opportunity. Um, we, you know, had one-on-one -on -one discussion with clinicians regarding testing and were a very appreciated, appreciative of our Pennsylvania Bureau of Laboratories for their weekend and holiday flexibility for getting these tests done quickly. Um, through many, many holiday weekends. Next slide. And then, um, of course, we had some public communications. Our first public communication was when we found out that our when our one of our initial cases um, notified us that they had been in an outpatient visit um, in a in a large outpatient tower with pediatric family medicine. Uh, providers, the lab, uh, um, a pharmacy. So there was no way we would be able to reach all of those um, people that may have been in contact individually. So that was kind of our first public outreach. And then we released two health alerts um, on December 2nd and I'm sorry, January 2nd and 9th, and then um, daily press releases um, for several weeks. And then we had a blog post where we updated new exposure sites daily as we found out about them. Again, the healthcare facilities were very appreciative of that um, and implemented a lot of screening protocols to quickly um, get uh, possible cases back to rooms and uh, decrease exposures in those waiting rooms. Next slide. And then I'll just mention our vaccination rates in Philadelphia, um, like across the nation fell during the COVID pandemic, but are back on the upswing now. 93% of our children six and older are up to date on their vaccine. 
um, 97 percent are of our uh, school age children at at seventh grade are up to date on their MMR vaccine. I think um, our, our cases um, here in Philadelphia um, were uh, while they clustered in a daycare that was accepting of unvaccinated children, um, were not in a uh, kind of specific um, community. They uh, people had who who, um, who whose children were not vaccinated who were included in this outbreak had various reasons for not vaccinating. They weren't um, they weren't consistent. And um, in fact, I'll mention that a lot of the um, kind of preschool age children actually had older siblings who were vaccinated. So these weren't um, kind of long held uh, beliefs in most cases about not vaccinating, um, which which may be different than some other outbreaks. I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Epstein. Uh, and I want to thank all the members of this uh, this panel. Uh, we're a bit over time, but uh, but I think this is an important enough topic uh, that I'd like to take one to two questions or comments uh, from the members of the committee. And while we're waiting, uh, just a comment from my own personal experience. We have done a lot of discussion and activity in my state talking about trying to change some of our current exemption rules and uh, have run into some Pandora's box challenges in past years. And I think that's something we all have to keep in mind. Uh, Rob Schechter, I see your hand up. Please go ahead. Thank you, Bob. And uh, thanks to the panel for your, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, two quick questions. Um, I believe Dr. Crowcroft mentioned a um, lower rate, maybe 3% drop in MMR compared to DTP. And I'm wondering, her thoughts on, or the panel's thoughts on, on why that might be, if it's age-related, why that uh, cold chain-related, uh, hesitancy-related, or, or other factors that that resulted in, in larger decreases in MMR vaccine. And then um, second question or observation would be, along with, with trying to raise immunization rates in general, are there, are there measures outside of clinical encounters that can be done to inform travelers of, of the need to be protected prior to overseas travel to reduce importations. Uh, I think Dr. Hahn alluded to some of that, and, and, but is there a way that the travel industry or others can, can, can be a partner in, in getting the word out to those who aren't seeking clinical encounters before, clinical care before uh, going overseas? I'll just mention, I don't know the answer to the second question about um, uh, what kind of travel um, uh, changes can be made, but uh, we've also discussed that um, extensively. Our initial um, case was, um, while, while too young to get routine vaccinations, would have been old enough to get um, you know, a, a, an early vaccine for travel. Um, and you know could have pre prevented our whole cluster um, had they done that. So that's something we've we've discussed a lot and are very interested in. Thanks. If I if I should go ahead and answer the question about um, why measles vaccine hasn't caught up as quickly as diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Um, I think it is age related. We generally find that coverage at a global level and in many low-income countries gets lower the older the child so um, DTP being given to uh, young infants and then um, generally we're talking about the first dose of measles vaccine given at nine months although um, seen in some countries is given in tw at 12 or older but um, for the countries we're talking about it's generally nine months um, so we already have a, a problem with a drop off. And then if we have a system that isn't working that well, then it finds it even harder to to recover for those older children. Um, on top of that, many uh, low income countries really struggle to immunize children in the first year of in the second year of life. So um, they they uh, the 
essential program of immunization was originally really just for for one you know, children under one um and even though there's been a recommendation to to for immunization to be whole of life um and for children to be eligible for their infant vaccines up to five at, at very least uh, actually moving those changes along in the field has proved quite challenging in some settings so um, i think that's the other reason that if a child has delayed their their dose for one reason or another it's so very very hard to reach them in the second year of life in some countries thanks over uh, jeff duchin do you have our last uh, question or comment thank you um it, oh, thank you for all these presentations. I want to focus in on what I heard from my state and local health department colleagues, and it never fails to impress. But when we talk about measles outbreaks, we often think about vaccination, 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 first and foremost as the response, which is critical. But I'm impressed, and I would like to hear comments from my colleagues about the other incredible resources that are necessary to respond at the local level to a measles outbreak the investigative work, the incredible community outreach, um, the partnering, the translations, the needed repeat contact over time to get the history of exposures. I mean, we know the costs of these outbreaks can run up into the millions of dollars for these small community outbreaks. And I'm worried about the capacity of our local state and public health departments, particularly with re workforce issues, and attrition and uh, funding, you know, that we received during the COVID pandemic now uh, going away, that I'm witnessing a lot of withering of our capacity. And so I'm wondering if, if our um, local and state colleagues would like to comment on, you know, the resources that, that are needed uh, from their perspective and how they feel going forward with respect to how robust they feel we are prepared. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I'll start. Um, and um, as you know, um, Idaho is a very large rural state, and we hadn't had measles uh, other than these two cases in 2019. We really haven't seen measles for decades. So not only everything you mentioned, the incredible local public health effort, and they really stepped up for this one, the the long, lengthy incubation period, the incredible importance of getting folks to stay at home um you know to, to stay isolated um and then the um in, in addition to the immunization work i'll also mention that just knowledge has dropped off right you know pr not only providers but our local public health epis that are out there now in the field had never worked with the measles outbreak before and we got extremely lucky i think that this particular uh, household was pretty rural pretty isolated uh we could have had a lot of different uh, outcomes so i appreciate your comments about the immense amount of work that, and effort and resources that i think i feel like we've gone backwards because of covid you know it's uh affects the united states as much as it well maybe not as much but in the similar fashion as it did around the world that we've actually lost some capacity due to turnover just lack of experience uh, you know, the public is more frustrated, tired of us, <laughs> public health people telling them stuff. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. I can't speak to this from being a public health officer, but I can certainly say I hear it from my colleagues in the public health uh, area in my state as well. Uh, Dr. Epstein, do you get the last word? Uh, I think I, I just echo um, what Dr. Han mentioned. Um, you know, we've we've built up great capacity with um, COVID and um, trying to hang on to that as much as possible. But it it, um, it does require you know require a lot of work. Um, the investigations um, were long. Uh, all happened over holidays, um, and um, very appreciative of our team and. Um, yeah, I hope that we can keep it up with our staff. Well, again, I want to thank all the members of this panel, uh, all very good presentation, very important information for all of us. And I would encourage you also to, to look at the uh, comments and the resources that are put in the chat uh, by members of both of our panel and as well as uh, others that are on the call. But now I want to turn to our next panel. Our next panel is called Innovation Insight, Analysis of the Pipeline and Industry Investment. Last December, the Biotechnology Innovation Organization, or BIO, released a new report called The State of Innovation for Vaccines 
and prophylactic antibodies for infectious diseases. The report examines investment trends in vaccine development and reviews the global vaccine and immunization pipeline. Our next presenter, David Thomas, is one of the authors from BIO, and he'll discuss the report and some of the findings. Uh, David, I see you. Your slides are up. You have the floor. Great. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present on this, this new report. It's been about 30 days since, since we put it out. Some of the content is actually from last summer. So the uh, the main focus of the report is on innovation in the clinical pipeline. So the data you'll see is really taken from, from the summer of, of last year. And if you advance to the next slide, uh, inside this report, uh, what it contains is the history of vaccines. So I went back over the last 200 years globally and looked at every vaccine that's ever been used in a broad population and asked the question, what was the modality behind that vaccine? What were the technologies? A lot of that detail is in the appendix and in the introduction is summary. And I'll show you a, a couple of those tables in a minute of what the findings are. We do that with our reports so that when we go into a pipeline uh, assessment, we know what's been done so we can report on what's novel. So in this report, we're only going to be discussing novel clinical vaccine candidates that are in the pipeline. Uh, number two, this pipeline analysis includes industry, meaning it's going to be company-sponsored uh, vaccines in the pipeline. And lastly, the data comes from SightLine, uh, their Biomed Tracker and Pharma Project database. Uh, but we also go to every company website and make sure that the um, phase, et cetera, is up to date. Um, and there's an exception with COVID where we have kept a COVID pipeline online uh, since the beginning of 2020. And so some of the sources there are, are a little bit different. The other two areas we cover is investment. I'll show you uh, venture capital investment in the vaccine space over the last 10 years. In the report, you'll also find uh, public investment data and a very up-to-date assessment of the clinical success rates in, in overall in the industry compared to the vaccine space specifically. And finally, the part two is on the prophylactic antibodies. Uh, there isn't much investment data we don't have enough numbers for success rates, so it's really uh, a history versus the the new pipeline and what's what's happening there. And I have one slide on that today. So next slide. So over the last couple hundred years of vaccine development, this is what you find: we have been able to tackle thirty four pathogens. And if you look at the the pathogen type here, you can see that including uh, the November approval of the chikungunya um, vaccine, which didn't make it into the final cut of editing uh, when we were putting this together. It's a total of 34 pathogens, uh, but the RNA viruses are um, the standout here with a total of 17 RNA viruses compared to 10 uh, bacteria and six DNA viruses and, and one parasite. So a lot of innovation this century uh, the the 10, you can see 10 new vaccines coming online uh, this century. Most of those are RNA virus, and that really accounts for uh, more vaccines against RNA viruses than, than the others. The next slide. So across all of those vaccines, there are 11 modalities, at least the way we're, we're defining the, the modalities here. And next to the modality type, you'll see the, the number of pathogens here in, in the column. The top group there in yellow are the vaccine uh, approaches that use a virus. And in blue, the, the mRNA virus. We all know what that one pathogen is. And the, the largest group here is actually that first um, bucket there for live attenuated viral pathogens. Um, that has been used for, to conquer 14 pathogens historically. In number two, the modality of choice is really proteins. So either purified protein antigens at, at the bottom there or proteins that are embedded in type of a 
virus-like particle, either lipids or protein matrix or a combination of the two. Uh, so that it historically has been able to generate 11 vaccines, 10 of which are, are still used today. And third is the inactivated uh, virus itself. That is um, the, the second one there. And an example of that would be in, in China, the use of the COVID vaccine, which was an inactivated uh, virus. And for replicating a uh, viral vector and non-replicating, uh, that has been used uh, with success of both of those actually for Ebola. Um, so that's also relatively new. Um, that those have entered into um, the vaccine armament. The, the on the right here we have the glycoconjugates for, for pathogens. Um, you know, one uh, capsid carbohydrate pro, um, vaccine still in use, and a couple of the uh, bacteria. Live attenuated example would be uh, the BCG vaccine for tuberculosis, as an example. Uh, but there are a couple of completely inactivated bacteria. Uh, vaccines as well that are used as, as the antigen. Uh, next slide, we'll take a look at the pipeline itself. So the pipeline right now has four additional modalities. So they have now the, the DNA vaccines, which don't have any approval precedent, uh, but also taking the mRNA approach one step further and creating self-amplifying mRNA. So that is now in the pipeline uh, against three different pathogens. We also have small peptides that are being used as, as vaccines. And by our definition, that's less than 50 amino acids for the antigen. And a few that are whole cell expression systems. So this could be a human cell that you put into the body that expresses the antigen or a yeast cell or, or a bacteria cell. Uh, next slide. So the number of vaccines is is placed in this next column here uh, to contrast with how many pathogens are being addressed in the current pipeline. The total pipeline is 249 vaccines from phase one through phase three, including um, a couple on the um, un under review with with the FDA. What you can see here is that the proteins, uh, again, stand out as the, the number one modality of choice with 87 vaccines. It's over 30 total unique, unique pathogens in that bucket. And mRNAs come in second. So you have 40 total vaccines in the pipeline against 17 pathogens. That's, that's quite, quite a big step up in the last uh, number of years uh, for the mRNA field. And over on the, the vaccine space, you can see that there's uh, one of those groups, the non-replicating viral vectors, such as the adenoviral vectors, MVA, et cetera, that have been mutated to not replicate. With 23 vaccines, that's very similar to what we see with the glycoconjugate vaccines, where you have 24 going against nine pathogens. So that's where a lot of the concentration is um, from a modality perspective and a you know, number of, of pathogens. On the novel technology side, the saRNA, uh, which has not been around for very long, uh, strikingly has 13 vaccines um, in total going against those three pathogens. And, and the DNA vaccines um, in coming in second there for, the, for these new modalities with 11 vaccines uh, against four pathogens. Next slide. So here we take a look at what the pipeline looks like by phase, also by, by pathogen type. So this kind of compares to that first slide I showed about the, the history of vaccines. Similarly, we have a lot of RNA virus pathogens that we're going after. COVID is that second line there. So 28% of the pipeline remains um, for COVID. And like I said, we've been keeping track of COVID vaccines since early 2020, and we do fail programs. So we've seen roughly 50% of the total vaccine programs started have failed or have gone inactive, but this is still 69 total clinical programs 
that we deemed as as active um, as of last uh, summer. Um, so that makes this this RNA virus um, pathogen space account for 62% total of the entire pipeline, uh, whereas bacteria under under 20%, DNA virus is 14%. Uh, the the bottom row there is where we place the combos. So to qualify for a novel combination vaccine, there has to be one antigen in the vaccine that is novel. Uh, and so there, we're counting uh, 10 of those uh, total. That's 4% of the pipeline and, and the parasite. Most of that is actually malaria. Um, and that it accounts for 3%. So by phase, when you look at these numbers, you can see that the, the pipeline is, is very early stage. So 119 total programs, almost half the pipeline is very early stage. We technically have three on the other end of the pathway, three that are under review with the FDA because uh, that number four there from the paper has already transitioned into an approval. It's not the case for, if you just look at the bacteria pathogens, we actually see more in phase two than in phase one and about equal for DNA viruses. So I think the, the pipeline is skewed to that phase one in part because of COVID, but also because of the other RNA viral uh, targets that are in, in the pipeline. Uh, next slide. So this is probably the most important slide of, of the entire deck. And at a top line, this is showing how many pathogens we're addressing in the entire pipeline across the whole industry. And of those 249 programs, we have 51 pathogens, but now it's technically 30 uh, pathogens that don't have any vaccine precedent. So from a headline perspective, that's great. The industry is doing a lot. Uh, there's a lot of um, breadth. But then you look at the numbers, and the takeaway is that we have a depth problem. So we have Staphylococcus, gonorrhea, chlamydia, West Nile virus, Coxsackie virus, all with, with one vaccine in development. So a lot of ones and twos on here, in particular where you see uh, where we don't have precedent for, for vaccines. So the take home is there's a lot of breadth, but not that much depth. And on the next two slides, I'll show you why that's either the case or why it's why it's important. So uh, next slide. So here are the success rates. So if, if you look over on the right in yellow, you'll see the infectious disease vaccines. If you're trying to take a drug from phase one, first in human, all the way to approval, you have an 11% success rate. It's close to one in 10. Even though that is above and beyond the small molecules, as an industry, these are for novel small molecules. Um, oncology small molecules is actually below 5% chance of success. But that one in 10 means that you, to ensure an approval of a vaccine, you would wanna have 10 going into phase one, not one or two. So that's where I say this is a very thin pipeline um, because from a probability standpoint, to ensure that you're going to have vaccines for all these diseases, you, there needs to be more in each of those indications. On the left, you can see by phase the success rates and how that compares to the antibodies that are not infectious disease antibodies. It's the, the bin called non-vaccine biologics in green and the other small molecules. Phase one success is about 50-50, whether you're a vaccine or, or a small molecule. Slightly higher phase two, but really where vaccines have been standing out is in phase three, where it's 17% more success than the small molecules. So a total 67%, so a two thirds chance of the phase three actually moving on to a filing. And at that filing stage, you know, you're approaching 100% with vaccines. Uh, but a lot of the, the delta versus the industry is really in that uh, phase three success, which towers above the other modalities. Next slide. 
So here's the investment, and this might be one of the reasons the pipeline is so thin. So if you look at 10 years of venture capital investment, and this slice of the data is just for U.S. companies developing vaccines, but you can see the peak during COVID in 2021, where there was a lot of investment in biopharma overall, 9.7 billion went to oncology companies and half a billion dollars to the vaccine companies. There are individual oncology companies that were able to raise more than the entire vaccine industry in a single year. So it's, you know, looking at that slide, you can see it looks like a trickle of venture capital investment in companies with lead assets in the vaccine space. On the right, you can see the ranking, if you will, for um, where investors put their money. It's 2.3% in the peak year. So there's oncology there near 40%, but there are um, neurology companies, rare disease companies that make up a, a bulk of the other uh, amount of investment that goes into these companies. But only two to three percent, you know, for the last decade going into that space. So that makes for um, likely a very thin, thin pipeline. So now on to the, the antibody slide, the last slide. So just to summarize what we found in the prophylactic antibody space, the, the precedent here is seven or eight pathogens, depending on, on how you count the um, Ebola and the COVID antibodies. Uh, some of these have historical precedent as immunoglobulins. So we would bin those as a polyclonal approach to treatment, typically in a, a post-exposure prophylactic setting. And you can see some of the, the antibodies, whether it's RSV, anthrax, um, a lot of these are, are fairly recent uh, approvals. On the right, the clinical pipeline right now has in total, 11 pathogens, and seven of these are completely new um, to to the antibody or um, to the antibody space. But to the vaccine or antibody, that's highlighted in yellow. So there are four pathogens that don't have a vaccine and don't have any um, post-exposure uh, prophylactic antibody approval. And it's a total of 16 programs. The majority of these are monoclonal antibodies. And, and two of them are, are polyclonal. But compared, you know, 16 compared to close to 250 for vaccines, uh, this is, I, I would say, early days uh, for, for the antibodies. And there hasn't been as big an emphasis as an industry to work on the, the antibody approach. And I think that's the last slide. And there's one more just to point out uh, where you can get this report at our bio website, bio.org, and the IA stands for Industry Analysis, IA Reports. That's where we put all of our publications. Um, last year, we published on antimicrobials. So if you're interested in that space, you can find a very similar breakdown of, of that space in infectious disease as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was an interesting report and uh, ties in very well with the work that the Innovation Subcommittee is, is making. Uh, do I have any uh, quick questions or comments from David? Going once. All right, well, thank you very much for your presentation. We're gonna make a slight change in our uh, uh, order of uh, uh, presentations. The Innovation Immunization Subcommittee update will move to later in the afternoon. I now have uh, 1.53 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, we're gonna take a short break. Uh, we will return uh, promptly at 2 p.m. Eastern time for the Strong Supply Chains uh, uh, panel presentation. Thank you for joining us for our February 22-23 National Vaccine Advisory Committee uh, meeting. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.